Now, it's, it's, it's been a couple of weeks. We took a little bit of a break. So uh, in, in, uh, uh, th this morning, we're just going to pick it up where we left off last time. And so last time, we were in verse 27. So this morning, we, we want to uh, pick it up in verse 27, and then we're going to finish this chapter in a message that I've titled, The Danger of Unbelief. The Danger of Unbelief. But first, let's pray. Father, we... we we open your word this morning, and we pray that as you, as we open our word, uh, your written word to us, we pray that you would open our hearts to hear your word, to receive what you would say to us. Lord, maybe there's some in this, in this room who, who don't even know you, uh, that, that don't have a relationship with you. Maybe there's some that's wa that are watching online, and, and they've, they've kind of been rejecting you. Well, Lord, maybe this is the word that they need to hear from you today. So Lord, we, 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 we open our hearts to you, uh, we, we surrender to you, and we want to receive what you would say to your people through your word in this place today. We pray this now in Jesus' name, and everyone say it. Amen. Amen. Now, is it just me, or, or, or maybe you've noticed that, that it seems like we're living in a day where, where people believe almost anything, right? I mean, people today, nowadays, believe some of the most unbelievable stuff. I mean, there are people today that, that believe in Bigfoot and, and UFOs. You know, maybe you saw the, the logo or the, or the bumper sticker uh, that, you know, looks like this, has a Bigfoot with the UFO and says, believe. You know, or, or, you know, nowadays people are willing to believe that there's life on Mars. People are willing to believe in some of the most outrageous government cover-ups and, and conspiracy theories. In fact, there are people who believe that the earth is flat, a flat earth. You know, maybe you saw this meme a while back that says that, that the flat earth society has members all around the globe. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> And so nowadays, people are willing to believe almost anything, and yet many of those same people are not willing to believe in Jesus. And so this morning, as we finish up John chapter 12, we're, we're going to talk about the danger of unbelief, specifically the danger of not believing in Jesus. So now with that, let's pick it up where we left off last time, verse 27. As we look at verses 27 through 36, in this section, we are looking at the stumbling block of the cross. In other words, some people don't believe because it's the cross that trips them up. It's the cross that they have issues with. And so in verse 27, Jesus says, now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? For, for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven saying, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. And Jesus answered saying, this voice came for your sake, not mine. Now this is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. And so the crowd answered him saying, well, we've heard from the law that, that Christ remains forever. How can you say that the son of man must be lifted up? Who is this son of man? And then Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest, you be, uh, lest the darkness overtake you. Then one Sorry, the one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going, but you have the light. Believe in the light that you may become sons of the light. So now, as we pick this chapter back up, let's kind of retrace our steps and kind of remember how we got to this point in chapter 12. Remember, at this point, uh, we're coming off the, the heels of, of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And on the heels of that, then Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And there's this, light, this huge crowd that's gathered there. And, and this crowd is there not only to see Jesus, but to see Lazarus, whom Jesus raised back to life. And so, of course, as, as Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, the, the crowd there, they are waving palm branches, and they're chanting and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. And as we saw a, a couple of weeks back, uh, this phrase, Hosanna, is an ancient phrase that means, save us now. Save us now. And really, it was a victory chant. Because in, in many ways, they were hoping that Jesus would be like a, a military general, a, a conquering king who would, who would ride in and give them conquest over the Roman Empire and bring them victory. But within a matter of days, 
the very ones who are now chanting Hosanna, Hosanna, will be the very same ones who will be chanting crucify, crucify. And, and this just reminds us how, how fickle the crowds can be, right? I mean, one minute you're up and the next minute you're down. I mean, one minute you're, you're living in the penthouse and the next minute you're in the outhouse. I mean, you know, they're, they're up and down. Reminds us of the time that Winston Churchill was, was about to give a speech to a, to a crowd of about a thousand people. And, and right before he went up, one of his aides whispered in his ear and said, Winston, isn't it great that, that a thousand people came to hear you speak? Now, Churchill, who was known for his quick wit, he turned and said, nope, not really, because I know that 10,000 would come to see me hanged. <laughs> you know, I mean, one minute you're up, the next minute you're down. And this was what was happening with Jesus. One minute they're chanting, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, a victory chant. And the next minute they are chanting, crucify, crucify. But why? We wonder what happened, what provoked this crowd? What, what, what caused them to, to go from a victory chant to all of a sudden chanting for his death? In a word, the cross. The cross is what happened. Now, first of all, Jesus, knowing the horrors that, that awaited him as, as he was going to be scourged, that is whipped by a Roman cat of nine tails, then beaten with fists, and then nailed to a cross, and then ultimately, be, for the first time in eternity, be separated from, from his heavenly father. And so Jesus, knowing what was waiting for him, it says in verse 27, he says, now is my soul troubled. Now that word troubled there uh, in the original is the Greek word teraso. This is a word that means to, to shake up or to stir up. To shake up or to stir up. In fact, what's interesting is that this is the, the, the very same word that was used back in John chapter 5 where we met this, this paralyzed man who was waiting outside the pool of Bethesda. And what was he waiting for? He was waiting for the waters to be stirred up. Now, this is the same word. And so this is a word that, that's describing that, that the Lord was, was deeply disturbed. Uh, in, internally, he, he, was, he was deeply agitated and, and deeply shaken. In, in fact, uh, the other three Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, those three Gospels uh, describe for us just how disturbed Jesus really was. Because in those Gospels, we read that, that Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane and he prayed. And as he prayed, the Bible says that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Now, uh, medical experts tell us that this is actually a rare medical phenomenon known as hematidrosis, which is a rare circumstance where, where your body is under so much stress that, that, that literally the tiny blood vessels in your sweat glands literally burst open, causing blood to mix with your sweat, giving it the appearance that you are sweating drops of blood. And so Jesus was, 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 was emotionally under a lot of stress. He was greatly disturbed. And, and, and it's in that condition that, that, he, that, he, that he, he says, my soul is troubled. And then he goes on to say, Father, glorify your name. And then there's a voice that came from heaven saying, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Now it's interesting. There, there, are, there are three different times that the heavenly father speaks audibly from heaven in the life of Jesus. Pardon me. The first time, you remember, was the baptism of Jesus, where after Jesus comes up out of the water, the heavenly father speaks and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I love and I am well pleased. And then the second time was, was on the so-called Mount of Transfiguration, where Jesus was there with, 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 with Moses and Elijah. And all of a sudden, Peter's kind of rambling on about, about building three tabernacles, three tents. He's like, you know, Jesus, this is great. We can make a tent for you, a tent for Elijah, and a tent for Moses. We could just stay camping up here on this mountain and never leave. I mean, this would be wonderful. And then all of a sudden, as Peter's still talking, God the Father himself interrupts Peter. And, and, and God says, this is my son, hear him. In other words, he's like, Peter, zip it. <laughs> Stop talking, start listening. And so each time that, that, that the Father speaks from heaven, it was to authenticate Jesus. Now, having said that, you know, in, 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 in our day, you know, in our lives, you know, there, there are times where, you know, in, in our time of distress, in our time of agony, in those times, we, we think what we need is, is an encounter. 
an experience. We think that we need to hear the voice of God. You know, we, we need some affirmation or, or some confirmation that, that God is still with us, that God has not left us, that God has not forsaken us. Now, it's on that note that it's interesting that, that Jesus turns and he says, this voice came for your sake, not mine. You see, the Father was not reassuring Jesus. I mean, even though it was Jesus who was about to sweat great drops of blood, even though it was Jesus who was deeply disturbed, you know, deeply moved and, 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 and distressed from the inside out, even though Jesus was the one that was disturbed, the Father was not re reassuring Jesus. Rather, the Father was reassuring them, the crowd. But why? Why? Well, because they were about to hear something that was absolutely unbelievable. In fact, case in point, in verse 32, Jesus says, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. John comments and says, He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So they're hearing something unbelievable. Jesus is telling them he's going to be lifted up. In other words, lifted up on the cross. He was going to die by crucifixion. And to them, this was unbelievable. In fact, how do they respond? They respond by saying, well, we've heard in the law that the Christ remains forever. That he lives forever. That he's eternal. That he doesn't die. Listen, they weren't wrong. In fact, way back in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, the prophet Daniel has a vision about the Messiah. In fact, in Daniel 7, it's called the vision of the ancient of days. And it says that, that his kingdom is everlasting. In other words, his, his kingdom is eternal. In other words, he reigns forever. He, 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 he reigns forever. And so like, wait a minute, how can you live forever, reign forever, and yet die on the cross? You see, what they were completely missing was that in the Old Testament, by the way, that phrase Old Testament, that's, that just refers to all the books in the Bible before the birth of Jesus. So in, in the Old Testament, what they missed was that it was actually prophesied that the Messiah would come not once, but twice. That the Messiah would come two different times. And that first of all, in Isaiah chapter 53, it was prophesied that, that the Messiah would first come as the suffering servant the suffering servant who would be wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. And yet the people in Jesus' day were, were so enamored by this idea of a, of a Messiah who would come as a conquering king, who, who would overthrow the, the rulers of this world. They were so enamored by, by that concept that they completely missed that he would also first come as the suffering servant who would die for our sins. Listen, not only would he die, but, but he would die the most appalling death that you could imagine as he would be nailed to a cross. Crucifixion. In fact, the, the rabbis of those, of those ancient days taught that, that anyone who, who had been crucified would, would, was cursed by God. Cursed by God himself. Now they got that from Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, where it says, anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. And so they took it to mean if you're hung on the tree, that is hung on a cross, then you were under God's curse. So like, wait a minute, how can you be God's anointed one? How could, how could you be the savior? How can you be the Messiah and yet be under God's curse? It makes no sense. This is why later on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, the apostle Paul says, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and to the Greeks. No, he says it's a stumbling block. Why a stumbling block? Why is it something that, that, that causes you to stumble, that trips you up? Why? Well, because again, to the Jews, anyone who was crucified, to them, that meant that you were under God's judgment. And so like, wait a minute, how can you be the Christ? How can you be God in human flesh and also be under God's judgment at the same time? It makes no sense. But you see, they, they, the problem is that they were busy looking for a conquering king, not a suffering servant. There were two prophecies. There, there were two comings of the Messiah. They were looking for the conquering king, not the suffering servant. You see, they didn't understand that the son had to be treated like sinners so that sinners could be treated like the son. And so the, the, the problem that some people have is the cross. The reason some people do not believe is, is, that, is that the cross stumbles them. It trips them up. But now as we 
uh, continue in verses 36 through 40, we now look at the danger of having a hard heart. The danger of a hard heart. So in verse 36, after Jesus says, while you have the light, believe in the light that you may become uh, sons of the light. Then verse 36 goes on and says, when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. And though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word of the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Saying, Lord, who believed the, 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 who believed what he heard from us? And, 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 who, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Now, by the way, let, let me point out that that, that that section we just read, in, in many ways, that is a transitional section. Transitional meaning that, that right now we're going from the public ministry of Jesus to the private ministry of Jesus. We're going from the time where, where Jesus would minister to the crowds to now a new time where now Jesus was just ministering to his 12 disciples. And, and so in many ways, chapter 12, verse 36 ends the public ministry of Jesus as it says that he departed and hid himself from them. So that's the end of his public ministry. And so now the, the rest of this chapter is really sort of a, a, an awkward in-between period uh, where, where you're in between the public ministry and the private ministry of Jesus. And so now John kind of gives a summary of, uh, of the people who believed versus the people who did not believe. And so he says in verse 37, though he had done so many signs before them, yet they still did not believe in him. And think of, of all of, the, of, the, of the, the miracles that they witnessed, all of the things that they witnessed with their own eyes. I mean, with their own eyes, they, they, they've seen the blind have their eyes opened. Uh, they, with their own eyes, they've seen the paralyzed walking. They've seen Lazarus rise from the dead. In fact, let's not forget that just a couple of verses ago, we, we saw that, that even with their very own ears, they actually heard the voice of God the Father himself speaking from heaven. And they heard it with their own ears. In fact, when you look at all four of the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you count up all the miracles that Jesus performed, you'll count 34 miracles that Jesus performed before the people. And yet despite everything they saw, everything they witnessed, everything they heard with their own eyes, yet they still refused to believe. And so this really speaks of the hardness of the heart. The hardness of the heart. And that's why Jesus now quotes from the prophet Isaiah. Here in verse 40, he says, he's blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Now, by the way, Jesus was quoting from, from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10. And really, by, by quoting Isaiah, that, that, that passage in Isaiah is really underscoring the danger of unbelief. The danger of unbelief. You see, the danger is that, is that every time you choose not to believe, the, the, you, your heart gets harder and harder. And so every time you, you deny the, the miracle of God, or, or every time you deny the love of God, or every time you deny the, the message of God, it gets easier and easier to keep denying him because your heart is getting harder and harder every time. It's been well said that, that we make our choices and then our choices make us. You know, you might think of Pharaoh back in the days of Moses. You know, Moses comes to Pharaoh and he, and he says, you know, uh, you, you need to heed God. You need to listen to God. If you don't listen to God and, and, let, and let our people go, then a plague will come upon you. And, and this happened time and time again. And yet every single time we, we read this phrase that it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. In fact, five different times we, we read that, that Pharaoh would, would basically cry uncle and say, okay, I, I give up, I'll, 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 I'll do anything, I'll let your people go, just, just make these plagues stop. And then after the plague stops, all of a sudden, Pharaoh has a change of heart, and we read this phrase that says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And we read that five different times. In fact, actually, six different times that the Bible mentions that his heart was hardened. But you see, the first five were self-inflicted. That is, the first five times, Pharaoh was hardening his own heart. 
But then on the sixth and final time, then, then we read these words that it says that God hardened his heart. For example, we read in, in Exodus chapter 10, verse 20, it says, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now here's what's interesting. This time a different word was used. You see those first five times when it says that Pharaoh was hardening his own heart, a a particular uh, Hebrew word was used. But then on the sixth and final time when it says that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, a completely different Hebrew word was used for the word hardened. In fact, this this word in the Hebrew is really a word that, that speaks of the hardening of concrete, the hardening of cement. It's a word that, that, that means to, to set firm or to make firm. You know, it's the idea that, that when you pour concrete, the longer you let it stand, the harder and harder it gets. And this is what was happening to Pharaoh's heart. You see, over and over again, Pharaoh would, would, would harden his heart over and over and over five different times until finally on the sixth time, God's like, you know what? I've had enough. Enough is enough. You know, have it your way. You you, want to be obstinate? You want to be calloused? You want to be stubborn? You want a hard heart? Fine. I'll I'll give you what you want. I'll firm it up. I'll I'll make your decision firm. I'll set it in stone. It will be permanent. You see, the danger of having a hard heart is that eventually it gets so hard that God gives you over to the hardness of your heart. He makes it permanent. Permanent. The danger of of having a hard heart is that eventually he gives you what you want. And now as we pick it up, verses 41 through 43, we, we now see the danger of public approval. The danger of public approval. John writes in verse 41, he says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory. In other words, Jesus's glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, Many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So they they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And so it says that that what they were afraid of is that they were afraid, it says, of being put out of the synagogue. Now the term that's used here is the Greek term aposunagogos. It's a term that that means unsynagogued. Uh, it means excommunicated. It means disfellowshipped. In, in other words, what, what they were afraid of is that, is that if they believed in Jesus, they were afraid that, that they would go from being the leaders before the people to now all of a sudden being treated like lepers by the people. They'd be completely disowned, completely cut off from society. No one anywhere would have anything to do with them. Completely disowned. And this is what they were afraid of. You know, in our, in our modern times, we kind of go through the same pressure. I mean, you know, haven't, haven't you seen this to be true? Where, you know, I mean, in, in this world, it's like, you know, as, as long as you continue to, to waste your life in, in drinking and drugging and, and sleeping around, then this world has, has no problem with you. They have no problem with that. But the moment you turn to Jesus, I mean, the moment you take a stand for Jesus, they don't want anything to do with you. You know, they don't want to hang out with you anymore. They, 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 don't, they don't call you. They don't talk to you. They don't invite you over for their little barbecues. They're not inviting you over to their Super Bowl party. They don't want anything to do with you. And so it's some of that same pressure that, that they're afraid of. Now, in the same way, you know, maybe, maybe you're here this morning or maybe you're joining us online. Maybe later listening on the radio. And maybe you're sort of on the fence about Jesus. In other words, on the one hand, you, you, you want to give your life to Jesus, you want to believe in Jesus, but at the same time, you're afraid. You know, maybe you're afraid of what your husband or, or your wife or, or, or your family might think. You know, you're afraid that they'll look at you and say, you know, you're, you're nuts. You've lost your mind. You've been brainwashed. Or maybe you're worried that, that you know, that you, what your coworkers might think, or, or you're afraid of uh, how your classmates may treat you when they find out that you've been going to church, that you're now into Jesus. Listen to this. The Bible warns us in Proverbs 29, 25, say, saying, the fear of man brings a snare. Living by the core of public opinion is a trap. Being worried about what everybody thinks about you is a trap. I think the late Warren Wiersbe was right when he said, you know what? It's better to fear God and go to heaven than it is to fear man and go to hell. And so listen to this. God's not looking for secret admirers. God's not looking for for those who go to church on Sunday, but then go into hiding on Monday. 
He's not looking for, for, for secret admirers. Listen, God's looking for those who are bold enough to be his witnesses, not those who are trying to go into witness protection. And so it says that they, they, they loved the glory of man more than the glory of God. In other words, they feared the opinion of man more than the opinion of God. And that's what kept them from God. That's what kept them from truly believing was because they cared more about the, 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 the public approval of people. And so now, in this last section, verses 44 through 50, we, 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 we want to underscore the danger of unbelief. Verse 44, And Jesus cried out, saying, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into this world as, as, as light, but whoever believes in me may not, uh, that, that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my word and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come uh, into the world to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and, and, and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So now again, by, by way of review, in this passage this morning, we, we've met three different groups of people who do not believe. And by way of review, group, group one were, were those who were offended by the cross. The, those who, who the, the cross is what trips them up. You know, and even today, you know, you meet people and it's the cross that they have a problem with. You know, maybe you talk to somebody and, and they're like, you know, well, well, why is Christianity such a bloody religion? Or somebody might say, you know, well, you know, I, I refuse to believe in, in a heavenly father who's so abusive that he would kill his own son on the cross. And so there are people today who, who have a problem with the cross. That's what trips them up. And then number two, by way of review, there are some, as we said, who do not believe because of the hardness of their hearts. And, and yet the, the danger is that every time they harden their heart towards God, the harder their heart gets until ultimately God gives them what they want. He's like, you want a hard heart? Fine. I'll, I'll make it permanent. I'll set it in stone. And by the way, can I just say that, that, that the flip side of that is also true? Listen, if, if you set your heart towards God, if, if, if you make a decision for God, if, if you want to live for God, if, if God is the desire of your heart, you know what? He can set that in stone as well. He can make that firm as well. And then thirdly, we met this group who, who do not believe because they were more concerned with public approval than they were with God's approval. And yet finally, and summing it all up, how does Jesus respond to all three groups? Well, he responds by saying in verse 47, If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. So, you know, he says, he says, I came to save the world, not judge it. That's interesting. You, know, you ever talk to somebody and, and they're like, you know, I refuse to, to believe in, 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 a, in a God who's so unloving that he would send people to hell. Ever hear something like that? Well, if, if you notice here, Jesus is saying, listen, I'm not sending them to hell. I didn't come to judge the world. He said, I came to save the world. And what he's saying is that, you know what? When you choose to reject me, you've put yourself in judgment. When you choose not to believe in me, you've sent yourself to hell. It's like this old uh, slogan from back in the 80s and 90s by, by the gun rights advocates. You've probably seen the bumper stickers that say something like, you know what, guns don't kill people, people with guns kill people. Well, that's in effect kind of what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you know what, God doesn't send people to hell, people send people to hell. When you choose to reject me, you've put yourself in judgment. I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save the world, he says. Now, earlier we, we mentioned Pharaoh and, and how, he, how he hardened his own heart over and over until it got to the point that finally God gave him over to the hardness of his heart and made it permanent. 
But there's a back story. And the back story is, is that history tells us that the Pharaoh that Moses was dealing with at that particular time in history was a Pharaoh by the name of Amenhotep II. Now Amenhotep II, history tells us, came into power, he came to the throne when he was only 18 years old. Listen, I have a daughter who's 18 years old. I mean, imagine this. 18 years old, I mean, he still has pimples on his face, and all of a sudden he's the most powerful man on the planet. And so now Moses is dealing with him and, and, and comes to him and says, listen, you, you let my people go that we may worship God. And in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, it says, and Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. He says, who is the Lord? I do not know the Lord. Well, he's about to meet him the hard way, Right? Because 10 different times, Moses comes and asks and says, let my people go. If you don't let them go, God is going to send a plague. And this happened 10 different times. And yet each and every time we read that, that Pharaoh hardened his heart. And he got harder and harder. I mean, time and time again, he, he rejected God's message. He rejected God's warnings. And he rejected God's miracles. And all the while, his heart was getting harder and harder, firmer and firmer, until ultimately it was too late. But here's the beauty of the whole thing. The beauty of the whole thing is that, is that although Pharaoh gave up on God, God never gave up on Pharaoh. And even though Pharaoh rejected God 10 different times, nevertheless, God sent Moses to Pharaoh 10 different times. In fact, in, in chapter 7, verse 1, God tells Moses, he says, you know what? I'm going to make you as God to Pharaoh. Meaning that, that when, when Pharaoh looks at you, he's going to see me in you. In other words, he, you're going to be my witness. Listen, Moses was witnessing to Pharaoh. But eventually, the, the clock ran out. Pharaoh's time was up, and he ended up being neck deep in the Red Sea. I mean, you remember the story, right? Uh, you know, they, 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 they chase the, uh, Moses and the children of Israel, and they chase them all the way to the Red Sea, and, and, and God's people are cornered. You know, you get the Egyptian army behind you and the Red Sea in front of you, and there is nowhere to go. And then all of a sudden, when all hope is lost, suddenly God parts the waters of the Red Sea, and Moses, he, he leads the people through the waters to the other side. But then, of course, Pharaoh leads his troops to their early death as the waters come crashing down around them. And yet, it was as if every time Moses came to Pharaoh, it was as if Pharaoh was be giving, being given an opportunity. In fact, opportunity after opportunity to repent. Opportunity after opportunity to bow his knee to the Lord. And at every time, he refused the Lord. He rejected the Lord. He, he put it off. And, and, and the harder he got every time. And we know people like this today, right? We, we know people just like Pharaoh. You know, you're talking to somebody about Jesus and, and they're like, you know, well, I, I, you know, one day maybe I'll accept Jesus, but you know, I'm, I'm too young right now. You know, I want to I wanna live it up first. You know, I want to have fun. I, I want to enjoy life. I'll do it later. Or, you know, maybe, maybe you're talking to somebody about, about how they need to get their life right with God. And they're like, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll get my life right with God, but you know, at first I've got I've to clean up my act first. I've got to get my life together first. You know, I've got I to gotta, I gotta stop drinking or I've got to stop drugging. I've got to get my life right and then I'll get right with God. Or, you know, they'll say, you know, I, I need to break off this affair, or I need to do this, or I need to do that, and then I'll turn to God. And so they put it off, and they put it off. But this is reminding us, the longer you put off a decision for Jesus, the chances are you're never going to make a decision for Jesus. And so Pharaoh is, is a vivid illustration that the longer you wait, the harder you get. It's been well said that, that procrastination is the devil's chloroform. And so the longer you wait, the harder you get. And, and, and besides that, listen, you don't know what the future holds. You don't know when your last day is. I mean, you know, one day here you are, you're procrastinating, you're putting off a decision for Jesus, and then the next thing you know, just like Pharaoh, you're neck deep in the Red Sea. You cross the street, boom, you get hit by a bus. You don't know. You don't know when your last day is. This is why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. Don't put off till tomorrow what needs to be done today because you don't even know if there is a tomorrow. Today is the day of your salvation. 
Now, maybe you're here in this room, or, or maybe you, you're watching online, and maybe you, you, you sound a lot like one of these three groups that we mentioned. You know, maybe you're someone who, who's offended by the cross. Or maybe you're someone who, who doesn't believe because you're, you have a hard heart. Or maybe you're someone who doesn't believe because, because you care more about what people think about you than you do about what God thinks about you. But just remember this. Just remember that each and every time you reject God, here's what's happening. He's not judging you. He didn't come to judge you. He came to save you. But every time you reject God, if you die in that condition, if you die rejecting God, then you have placed yourself in judgment. By rejecting him, you've put yourself in judgment. And so the Bible says today is the day of your salvation. Now then again, maybe there's someone in this room or, or maybe watching online, maybe even listening on the radio. And, and, and maybe, maybe you are a Christian. Maybe you're somebody who's given your life to Jesus and you were, you were following Jesus, but now lately you're sort of backsliding. You know, you're, you're turning away from Jesus a little bit. You're going back to, to that old uh, lifestyle, going back to that old friend group, going back to some of those old habits, getting involved in that old thought process. And, and those things are repeating over and over again. And you feel yourself slipping away. You feel your heart actually getting harder and harder. Well, listen, today is the day for you to, to maybe re-choose Jesus, to make a recommitment to Jesus. Today is that day. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you that today you brought us here to this portion of your word. Or because maybe today this was the portion of your written word that our life needed to hear, that our heart needed to hear. Lord, maybe, maybe we've got a hard heart this morning, but nothing can break a hard heart better than the love of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're confused and, 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 and you're bothered by some of the things like, like the cross or, or maybe you care more about what people think about you. Listen, I'm here to tell you that God loves you. In Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, I know the plans that I have for you to prosper you and not to harm you. God loves you. He's got a plan and a purpose for your life. Or maybe you're here and maybe you're a Christian, but, but you, you, you're kind of turning away. You're slipping away going back to the old life. And regardless, whichever one you might be, listen, today is the day for you to make a commitment or a recommitment. If that's you, pray with me. In fact, pray this with me. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, I surrender to you. I, I, I surrender my heart to you. And Lord, I pray that you take my heart of stone and make it love again. Give me a heart of flesh and so Lord, I pray that you'd come into my life, that you would change my life from the inside out. And that from this day forward, the, the, the desire of my heart would not be for my will, but rather thy will. That you would have your way with me for your glory in Jesus' name. Why don't we stand together and sing one last song to the Lord?